thank you for coming. Uh, tonight's going to be a great night. We have an opportunity to hear from two very conservative candidates running for governor. I know both of these people personally over the past couple of years. It's an honor to, to have them here tonight in Windham. But before we begin, I'd like to ask Paul Therrien to stand up and please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Now I'd like to ask our choir to come and sing the national anthem. Thank you very much. That was uh, excellent. Um, I'd like to just take a minute and tell you something about our group, the Southern New Hampshire 912 Project. Uh, we've been in existence for about a year and a half now, and we're a nonpartisan, community-minded group. We was formed by Windham residents, uh, Representative David Bates, Representative Rick Okerman, and myself. Uh, the group's mission is to bring Americans together and rekindle the same feelings and attitudes with the priorities that we had on September 12th, 2001, when we all took a little bit more time, a little bit more patience, a little bit more love for each other. That's where the name 912 comes from. Uh, we're conservatives. We share a common desire to provide a forum for an intimate, bi-directional flow of communication between community residents and our elected officials. It's with this in mind that we are hosting this debate tonight. We truly believe in representative government, and the only way we can have that is if we elect the people that represent our values. And the only way we can do that is to go through an educational process, and that's what I hope you get out of tonight. I'd also uh, like to mention that we invited Senators Hassan and Silly to participate uh, in, this, in a separate democratic gubernatorial forum that would have been held as well this evening. Uh, unfortunately, they did not accept our invitation. Uh, one more thing I want to mention is that our group will be hosting a Wyndham Representatives Forum this coming Tuesday at Town Hall. Uh, we've invited the Democrats and the Republican represent state representative candidates to come, and we've heard confirmations from most of them, and I expect uh, to hear at least one more. Uh, you can learn more about our group, if you want, by going to www.southernnh912.com, and that's listed on the back of your program. 
Uh, before I introduce the candidates and bring out our moderators, I just want to go through the debate format. Uh, we flipped a coin earlier, and Mr. Smith won. He has chosen to, uh, to speak second uh, in the opening statements and the closing statements. Uh, after the candidates are introduced, they're going to have two minutes to provide an opening statement. Our moderators will then alternate asking questions, and each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer. If any moderator feels that um, clarity would be helpful, they will follow up with the question, and the candidate will have up to a minute to reply. Uh, Tom Flaherty is our timekeeper. He's got uh, green, yellow, and red cards to alert the candidates as to when they're out of time. Uh, we're going to try to end this segment an hour after we start, so about 45 minutes after we start. And then we want to open it up to close to half an hour of audience <coughs> participation. When the audience asks questions, we ask that you hold them to 30 seconds each, and then we're going to ask the candidates to hold their answers to one minute. And that way, if we can be very efficient, we can get a lot of questions and answers in. Uh, our debate tonight will be moderated by two politically savvy individuals, uh, Paul Westcott and Andrew Hemingway. Uh, Mr. Westcott is the morning host of WGIR AM 610 and 96.7, The Wave, covering the state of New Hampshire. Paul can also be heard on 24-7 on iHeart's all-digital channel, The White House Brief with Paul Westcott. His career began in television news, working as an assignment editor and producer for NBC News slash MSNBC and Fox News Channel. Paul's passion for radio began in college at Fordham University, working for WFUV-FM, an NPR affiliate, where he honed his on-air skills as an anchor and beat reporter. At Fordham, Paul earned a BA and MA in political science. He currently lives in Manchester, New Hampshire, with his wife, Sarah. Please welcome Paul Westcott. <laughs> Mr. Hemingway is the founder and chairman of 4RG for a Republican governor, a political action committee dedicated to supporting the election of a Republican governor in New Hampshire's corner office. 4RG's website is a resource for all seeking information on the race. Before starting 4RG, Andrew was the NH State Director for Newt Gingrich and the former chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of New Hampshire. Please welcome Andrew. I will now ask each of our moderators to introduce the candidates, and I hope you enjoy the forum. served as legal counsel for the New Hampshire State Senate in 1991. In 1993, he was appointed by Governor Steve Merrill as chairman of the New Hampshire State Board of Education, where he served until 1996. In 2009, Obed was honored as New Hampshire's Distinguished Citizen of the Year by being the Webster Council Boy Scouts of America. And in 2011, New Hampshire's, Ameri New Hampshire's Americans for Prosperity honored him as Conservative of the Year in New Hampshire. For the first time, AFP bestowed this award calling him, quote, a proven conservative that has spent a lifetime advocating for smaller government, lower taxes, and a more prosperous business environment, both in New Hampshire and at the national level. Ovid and his wife, Betty, reside in East Manchester. It's my pleasure to introduce him. Over the morning. doing this debate, we said, this is going to be, it's going to be nice, but we're certainly going to hit some of the hard topics here, and we're going to try and see a lot of light between these two guys and see if there are some substantial differences. So that's what we're going to get into, and we're going to start off here uh, with something very fundamental. 
You know, it's fashionable for politicians to speak about individual liberty and freedom. It has been said that government grows larger, and as it grows larger, our liberties grow smaller, and that true freedom is being free from government coercion. Do you agree with these two ideas, and if so, what specifically will you do as governor to actually reduce the size of this massive bureaucratic nightmare known as the government? And we'll start with you, Ovid. Thank you, Paul, and good evening. Thank you all for coming out this evening and participating in New Hampshire's state sport, politics. It's critically important that we get involved in this cycle, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Your question, Paul, is absolutely, and the statement that's embedded there is absolutely correct. The inertial state of government is growth, and unless we have checks and balances and barriers to growth, uh, we're going to continue to labor under the growth pattern we've seen in this country really since for the last 50 years since World War II. I've been a strong advocate of limited government, the Tenth Amendment, and putting in those barriers, if you will, to government growth. Our pledge, our pledge against broad-based sales and income taxes is critical, at least on the Republican side, to keeping government in check. Our commitment, and my commitment, to, re, to re, repealing, if you will, the Claremont decision and restoring local control over education policy and funding is fundamental to keeping government in check and local. To the extent we can keep government local, we're going to keep government in check. And then regulatory reform is critically important. The first thing I'll do as governor is impose a 90-day moratorium on any new rules and regulations and require our agency heads to conduct an eco economic impact analysis. And then go forward and, and try to dismantle some of the regulatory structure we've allowed the executive branch to create. Uh, this is an opportunity we have to have leadership for a change in the governor's office. With your support, you'll have that leadership for a better New Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for coming this evening to participate, and thank you to Ken as well and the Southern New Hampshire 912 group for hosting this. You know, when I worked for state government, I used to have a sign on my desk that says, government expands to absorb revenue and then some, because it does. And that's why I've taken a pledge to oppose any new tax and fee increases here in the state of New Hampshire, as well as any broad-based sales or income tax. But there's other things that we can do on the state government level to make sure that the encroachment of the federal government on us doesn't get larger. We should have a cost-benefit analysis of all federal funds we're taking in and ask ourselves, are we spending more on the state and local levels than what we're actually getting in those federal funds. And we need a leader in the corner office as well who will push back against the federal encroachment on the EPA, the Employment Prevention Agency, and things like the Department of Education as well. It's time to get New Hampshire out of no child left behind. We should be setting our own high state standards as a state and not taking our direction out of Washington. So absolutely, it's incumbent upon the next governor to show leadership from the corner office and say we're gonna get New Hampshire's addiction off of the federal government while at the same time pushing back against the mandates that are coming out of Washington, D.C. Well, thank you, Andrew, for that question. Again, I already touched on upon some of this. It's incumbent upon us to exercise not only our 10th Amendment right as a state through the federal Constitution, but the seventh article to the New Hampshire Constitution as well that grants us state sovereignty. And we have to start exercising this a lot more as, as a state because we haven't been in the past, which is, which is what has allowed us this encroachment of all of these federal programs. With regards to Obamacare, first of all, I have already said publicly that I will not take a, a New Hampshire part, make New Hampshire part in the expanded Medicaid program. All that's going to do is bankrupt the state of New Hampshire in the future, and it's really a, a pathway to a monolithic single-payer system, which is, I think, what the Obama administration wants us to do. And absolutely, I will do everything in my power as a state to make sure that we don't have to take part in that program. You know, we did this recently with Real ID. 
on the state level, where the federal government wanted, wanted us to take part in a real ID program, and guess what? A lot of states lined up and said, it's an unconstitutional program, we're not going to allow, we're not going to have our states take part in that program. Absolutely, I would ex exercise that right under the 10th Amendment of the Federal Constitution and the 7th Article of the New Hampshire Constitution to get us out of Obamacare. If I understand the question correctly, Andrew, the question is, would I sign a bill that's passed by the legislature to nullify an action of the federal government? That's the question before us. I think we need to step back for a second and understand the framework of our Constitution and our nation. We are a nation that is based on the delegation of authority from the people to the state and then from the state to form the national government. It's interesting that James Madison said that we didn't need a Tenth Amendment. He thought it was so self-evident that we had a limited form of government, that enumerated powers were only those powers that the federal government had with all other powers reserved to the states and the people, which is what the Tenth Amendment provides. And yet, thank God, he was overruled, and we did adopt the Tenth Amendment. It's critically important. I've been a leader in New Hampshire fighting the federal government since the 1990s, when as the chairman of the State Board of Education, I, under my leadership, we said no to Goals 2000. We would have said no to No Child Left Behind. That's a Republican mistake and a Democrat mistake. If we've exhausted all remedies, that means suing the federal government. We should have been the first state to sue the federal government on Obamacare. We weren't even part of that litigation. Shame on us. If we've exhausted all our legal remedies, Andrew, and the legislature passes a bill calling for nullification, I will sign that bill. I'm pledged to sign or veto any bill that comes to me. And I'll take responsibility and ex exercise leadership of the as the governor of this state if that's what comes to pass. Thank you. Our next topic has to do with sustainability. This is something that we've heard quite a bit a lot of, quite a lot of about uh, lately. One thing is clear uh, that's unsustainable is the level of spending the government has decided to take on. Directly related to this are pensions and pension promises and health care costs that are plaguing many states, including New Hampshire. Do we need to be concerned about unfunded liabilities in the Granite State? And if so, what is the level of our exposure and what will you do as governor to deal with it? We'll start with Ovid this time. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's clear that we have unfunded liabilities in state government. And it's important that we take the reform measures that we need to in New Hampshire to put us onto a path of solvency. You know, I supported the initiatives of the legislature to start addressing pension reform. And it's important that we have the involvement of our state employees, our municipal employees who de depend on the retirement system and the benefit package we have as part of the compensation structure uh, to help begin that reform. And with new employees, prospectively, we should be moving into a defined contribution plan, not a defined benefit plan, which is what we have. Most private organizations and business have gone to a defined contribution plan. I did it as chairman of the state, I did it as the chairman of St. Mary's Bank. I did it as an owner of Divine Millimet and Branch, my law firm, where I've been an owner for 20 years. It's not easy. You've got to work with our employees to understand they can own their retirement asset. But it has to be done systematically, it has to be done smartly, it has to be done in a way that will assure the solvency of the fund. And that's what this is about. It's about putting New Hampshire, again, on a path of solvency. Uh, so I believe there is change that needs to, be ha needs to happen. We will make those changes, and, but we'll continue to work with our state employees uh, to honor our commitments to them, but also to ask them to join with us in making the necessary reforms here in New Hampshire. So here are the numbers. New Hampshire's pension system is currently a $5 billion unfunded liability in this state. It's the third worst in the entire country. It's only 59% funded right now, and the rate of returns we've been getting on it is less than 1%, which also, by the way, I don't know about you, if I was a wealth manager and I was getting less than 1% rate of return, I'd probably be fired from my job. So we have to look at why we're not getting a bigger rate of return than what we're getting right now. But the reality is that we do need to go from a defined benefit plan to a defined 
defined contribution plan, which is why I've said that I support for new hires coming into the system, putting them over to that kind of a system. It's what the federal government has, and it actually has worked well on the federal level. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing that right here in the state of New Hampshire, as other states have done it as well. And I was proud to stand with Senator Jed Bradley a couple of years ago when I was the head of Cornerstone and standing up for that pension reform that we need to solve in this state because it is a massive unfunded liability. We've kicked the can down the road for far too long, and it's time we take on this challenge in telling people the truth about what we have to do. But that's not the only biggest unfunded liability we have to get a handle on. There's another thing that's unsustainable, and that is the cost of health care in the state as well. It's killing small business owners. There's too many small business owners today that aren't even purchasing health insurance because it's so costly for them. Myself, as someone who's a self-employed small business owner, I'm paying a little over $17,000 a year right now out of pocket for health insurance. So that is another issue we can't continue to let go down the road. It's something that I will tackle as, a, as the governor of New Hampshire along with our uh, unfunded pension liability. Well, this is a function of the Constitution, so I don't think we're going to see it modified anytime soon. But the reality is that the next governor is going to have appointments to make. Uh, for instance, we know the Commissioner of Dread, uh, the Department of Resources and Economic Development, which, by the way, do you think we could change that acronym already from Dread to something that's more enticing for businesses to want to come here? But we have that vacancy that we're going to have to fill. The Attorney General's office, uh, Attorney General's position is going to be coming up as well. And, and I agree we need a new attorney general as well. But the reality is the next governor is going to have to show that they can hire the most competent people to these positions. And that's what I'm going to be looking for, is people who have both experience in the private sector, but also know how state government runs as well to put into these positions. And it's something that I'm intimately familiar with, because when I worked for a former governor, for Craig Benson, I was intimately involved in the nomination process. In fact, perhaps none bigger than a former attorney general named Kelly A at the time. So I know how this process works. I feel like I know the people who we need to look for to be in state government because I've run a state agency, but I've also been an elected official as well, and know that when you have people, you have to be, have the people with the right breadth of experience. And as I said, I want to see people that both have that private sector business experience that have good business acumen and can bring good business principle into state government. But at the same time, I want them to be somewhat familiar with how state government works because there is a ramp up period too. And we've got a lot of challenges that we have to tackle right now as a state. And lastly, we're going to change the culture in Concord in positions like DES, Environmental Services, again, the Department of Education, to making sure we're putting in good pro-business, pro-freedom commissioners in our state agencies. It is kind of an interesting job, isn't it, that we're running for? Two-year term, five executive counselors that have to vote three to two at least to approve any contract over ten thousand dollars, and you, you work with the other guy's management team. Um, but that's the New Hampshire way, and one of the advantages of that system is that you have built-in checks and balances. Now, I would prefer to be able to appoint my own management team, and if we're in a position to do that uh, and move in that direction, then I'd support it. But in the meantime, we need to elect a governor who knows how to work with people, who has the temperament to reach across the aisle and to bring people to state government and work with them to get the job done for the people of New Hampshire, because that's what it is, public service. And I'm proud to have been endorsed by some two public servants that are here tonight who demonstrate the kind of temperament, can-do spirit in their own public life, and that's former Speaker Donna Sytek and your state senator, Chuck Morse. I'm proud to have them on our team. 
But I look to them as role models, and we see this around New Hampshire, the local level as well as state government. I used to like to say the governor of New Hampshire is like a small town mayor. Uh, you're expected to know people and work with them outside of the formal office itself. And I know people that, based on my leadership experience in business and government and in the civic and charitable world to bring together to serve the people of New Hampshire. And we'll bring the best and the brightest and we'll have them part of our team. And that has to happen with the existing system. And then we can look at improving that system as we go forward. Well, we're now going to turn our attention to uh, education. And this one, we're going to go, and we haven't quoted John Ad Adams yet, so I think we should. John Adams said, children should be educated and instructed in the principles of freedom. Are we following this advice in our public schools today? And do you believe the academic standards for public schools should be set by the federal government, as has been done with No Child Left Behind? Or is there a better approach to return control back to the state and or local level? Over. Thank you. Education is an area of passion for me. As some of you know, I've been a former teacher, former head of the diocesan school board, which oversees our Catholic schools, and also uh, past chairman of the State Board of Education. I see former colleague of ours, Ken Paul, who's here uh, in the back. And we work together to serve the people of New Hampshire. Um, Washington has no business in the classrooms of our state, of our schools. It's a New Hampshire state responsibility. We should be demanding that the federal government dis disband the federal Department of Education and block grant education money to our state. And we should demand that the federal government fully fund its commitment under the IDEA, special education law that we participated in. 40% comes to New Hampshire. And then we need to start continuing to empower parents to work with their children and school teachers to make it happen and to make this work for our, our state. But part two, Article 83, which is the seminal provision of the New Hampshire Constitution on education, provides for character and citizen education as well as academic education. We've neglected teaching our children about what's right. And this is what the Constitution says. It says that the, the, uh, the legislators or the magistrates shall also promote in addition to the sciences, countenance and inculcate principles of humanity and general benevolence, public and private charity, industry and economy, honesty and punctuality, sincerity, sobriety, and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people. It's about time we give life to this provision of our Constitution. Thank you. So I have three kids, eight, six, and four. Two of them go to the public school system. My wife and I were educated through the public school system. I've taught in the public school system. She's a certified uh, special ed teacher. Why do I say all this? Because I'm tired of hearing that if you are pro-school choice, you are somehow anti-public education. I don't buy that for a minute. The reality is a rising tide raises all boats. And we need more school choice in the state of New Hampshire. And that's... That is why I've called for a very aggressive plan. If you go on my website, check out my education reform plan. In fact, go on both of our websites and check out my reform plan versus Ovid's reform plan. I call for a plan called Money Follows the Child, which, sends the, which rather than sending the money to the local school district, it sends the money directly to the parents and empowers them to send their children to the school where their child's going to learn best. We have a thriving charter school system right now in the state, but there's not enough of them right now. The Seacoast uh, Charter School out in Kingston, its enrollment has gone up every year for the last five years, but there's a 500 student waiting list to get in it right now because the demand is there, but there's not enough in school choice. And we need to promote school choice a lot more. The other thing we have to do is we have to reform tenure in the state of New Hampshire as well. If, if, if you're a teacher, if you're a teacher and you have a pattern of poor performance, you shouldn't be able to hold on to your job for the for your life of your career just because you have tenure. It should be something that's earned and something that you can lose as well. And I'll say this one one last thing here too. Most of the teachers in our state are great teachers. They do it for the passion. They don't do it for the money. It's the unions that are the problem. And I will take on the teachers' unions as the next governor of our state.
Can I actually just ask a quick follow-up on this one? Because it, it's interesting today. This is a, a really newsworthy item. We were talking about 6 to 9 on the Paul Westcott show. And <laughs> shameless plug. Uh, one of the things that uh, is happening now in Manchester City School Districts that people are up in arms about is 40-plus children classrooms. And you have these kids uh, to a point that one parent called a fire marshal. I mean, it got, it got that out of hand. If the federal government tomorrow came in and said, we're going to give you $3 million, but you've got to teach this course, this course, and this course, would you insist that Manchester or the state accept that money? No. I would not insist that they take that money. Again, this is what got us into the problem in the first place. We're still in No Child Left Behind right now. Both Democrats and Republicans agree that this is a terrible program that has hand-strung all of the local school districts. But you know why we're still in it? Because as a state, we see that $50 million carrot, and we're saying, oh, we can't afford to lose $50 million, so we're going to stay in a lousy program that makes us uh, adopt mediocre standards on a state level. We have to stop our addiction to federal government money and we have to say no once and for all. Ovid. And Paul, this is not something I just talk about. This is something that I've done as a leader for the state of New Hampshire. When we said no to Goals 2000 for precisely this reason, every time the federal government gives you some money, your money back, not the full dollar, it's about 30 cents or whatever it is, they attach strings to it. When I was chairman of the State Board of Education, I met with our de deputy commissioner at the time, Elizabeth Toomey. I said, how many people work in this building? She says, 300. I said, how many of these people can we deploy in the school districts of our state to help with Manchester, for example, if it's overcrowded? She said, none. Do you realize we are a federal outpost? I said, what do you mean a federal outpost? She said, every one of the people working here are doing the job of the federal government, either in whole or in part, they're paid by some federal grant program. Let's free ourselves of that tyranny that right now has gripped New Hampshire and start moving away from the dependence on Washington. I've done it. I'm not just talking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we do agree on a lot of things, don't we? <laughs> Especially how to work together. By the way, we are one team. You know that, don't you? There's a primary process. It's an inter-squad battle or competition, but we're one team. And we're going to be one team on September 12th. Right, Kevin? All right. On day one, I'm going to impose by executive order a 90-day moratorium on any new rules and regulations and require our state agencies to conduct an economic impact analysis that evaluates the cost of businesses, cities and towns, families of the new rules and regulations that are being proposed. And if the value, the stated purpose, doesn't far exceed the cost, we're going to pull those rules back. And then we're going to start doing an inventory of existing rules and repealing expiring, sunsetting those rules and regulations that are antiquated, redundant, not productive, not achieving a stated purpose. We need regulatory reform. And then lastly, I'm going to work with our legislative leaders to go to a biennial session and number two, not pass laws that have rulemaking authority in them. Stop passing a law that says to the executive branch, unelected officials, finish our work. That's what happens every time a bill is passed that has rulemaking authority in it. What the legislature has done is transfer legislative authority to unelected bureaucrats. I want to be a governor of the state of New Hampshire who doesn't have to worry about rulemaking because the legislature has done its work and complete, and by passing complete bills. And that's going to be a true reform that will free the citizens and businesses of our state on the issue of rulemaking. Thank you. 
Absolutely. We give much too much authority right now as a state to the government bureaucracy to set their own rules. And that is something we have to stop doing when we're legislating and crafting policy on the state level. We have to make sure we're not giving them as much leeway as we are right now. As I said before, too, I'm also going to look to have a cost-benefit analysis of the money that we're taking in, the federal monies that we're currently going after, and asking the question before we take any of those federal monies, how much are we spending on the state level? How much are we spending on the local level just to comply? with those federal regulations in order to get those funds because I guarantee you in some areas we're actually expending more than what we're actually taking in. And the other thing too is we have to cut down on the number of regulations and state agencies right now. When you go home tonight, I want you to Google a story. Just type, go to Google or whatever search engine you have and put in TurboCam and Turtles. And you're going to find a story come up about a company, TurboCam, that's in Barrington right now. They're, they're looking to expand. But the problem is they're having trouble expanding because where they wanted to expand to within a mile radius of where they want to put their new building, someone thinks they spotted an endangered, endangered species of turtle. And you can imagine what's happened next. All of the different rules and regulations this kind of business is having to go through now, site evaluations, the permitting processes, everything else. You read this story and you say, if I'm a business owner outside of New Hampshire and I'm reading this story, I'm saying, why would I want to come and start a business in this state when they're putting you know, somebody else, a business owner who's in that state, employing hundreds of people through this overburdensome regulatory environment? It's something we have to stop in the state of New Hampshire. We need to be a pro-business state, not a state that puts up roadblocks everywhere every step of the way. The next question we have, and this goes even deeper into individual rights versus state rights, and, and this is a big one. In Oregon a few weeks ago, a man paid a $1,500 fine and began to serve a 30-day jail sentence for collecting rainwater on his own property for personal use. In Oregon, the state owns the water. In New Hampshire, we have a Water Sustainabilities Commission and a legislative groundwater committee that believe in state ownership of our water, including well water on private property. If elected, what what direction would you give to the Water Sustainabilities Commission and the Groundwater Commission? Sure. Well, this Water Sustainability Commission sounds like something that was created by the state legislature, right? Wrong. This was created by an executive order from Governor Lynch, creating this commission of unelected, appointed people out of the governor's office to determine who owns groundwater, including ownership of well water as well. So here's what I would do as governor. I would make sure I contact whoever the head of the commission currently is when I take office and say, if you haven't submitted your final report of the commission, please do so, because as of today, I am rescinding that executive order and doing away with that particular commission. And then I will look to see how many other executive orders Governor Lynch has signed, setting up other bureaucracies, the third arms of state government, that have very, you know, don't have a lot of oversight in the state. And again, these are, are, are officials that aren't elected. They're appointed out of the governor's office and say, what other commissions are we going to rescind as well? Because there should be accountability and transparency in every single one of these commissions. I'm very troubled by some of the remarks I've seen from commission members that are in the public domain right now that talk about the state's ownership, again, of private well water. That's unacceptable to me. And so absolutely, I will rescind that executive of order. Okay. Ovid. Thank you, Paul. I don't think you're going to see a disagreement on this stage about this issue, but there's a difference. I actually know something about water rights and water legal, legal climate in which you deal with water issues. When I was uh, at the University of Wyoming College of Law, yes, I went to law school there, I was the editor-in-chief of what was called the Land and Water Law Review. Really exciting stuff, doesn't it sound like it? And we dealt with what we called Western water rights because in the West, including Oregon, there's a whole different legal context in which water is handled. In the East, we have what's called riparian rights. And unlike the West, where the water is owned by the state, by government, sort of like animals are owned by the state. Okay, that's, that's one of the paradigms. Water in the East is owned by the people who own the land. I'm about protecting private property rights including water rights for our property owners in New Hampshire. And making sure that we don't allow our bureaucracies, our unelected officials to take over power and then apply for grants to the federal government, as was done here in New Hampshire, 
uh, through a regional planning commission, for example, an unaccountable advisory group that now has a lot of money to dispense to advance an agenda that is not the agenda of the people of New Hampshire. This is part of getting control over regulation, over the executive branch, and over those entities that are operating outside of the proper authority of government. And on this issue, I will lead, and we will get to the bottom of this here in Wyndham and across the state. This is an important issue for the future development of New Hampshire and for business and families and individuals. Thank you. I think we would do what, what we need to do, and that is to err on the side of making sure our laws do not undermine, directly or indirectly, the rights of property owners in our state. And we've allowed it to happen through uh, regulations at the local level, and we've allowed local boards uh, to really, inter you know, really interfere with and intercede with development plans. In a lot of ways, that just is not consistent with an overall economic development plan for the state of New Hampshire. So we begin with the proposition, if you own your land, you develop what you want to on that land within reasonable restrictions. But part of the deregulation of New Hampshire needs to be focused on the invasion and the limitations and the encroachment on property rights. We saw last legislative session changes made to the eminent domain powers uh, in our state to preserve and strengthen those individual property rights, and I think that was appropriate uh, for the legislature to undertake. And then we, we should be inventorying what we're doing at the local level as well as regionally at the county level and at the state government level to, that interferes with property ownership. Um, we have a Department of Environmental Services that frankly is out of control. And there's no more, more or no better example of government interfering with property rights on a number of occasions. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have control over that agency as well as, again, the other parts of government that impede or impair our property rights. This is a critically important. Uh, we need to be a state that is known, not just regionally, but state na nationally, as being a state that stands with property owners and their rights. Thank you. Our founding father said there were three rights that are above everything else. That's life, liberty, and property. Private property rights are paramount and trump everything, and they need to be protected here in the state of New Hampshire. Now, some of you may be aware of something called the Com uh, Sustainable Community Initiative, which is a major power grab by the federal government, the Departments of Transportation uh, and HUD and the Department of, or excuse me, the EPA, which is looking to put uh, major, major onerous restrictions, taxes, and penalties on certain the ways you can use your land. They're trying to severely curtail private property rights of the citizens here in the state of New Hampshire. You say, now, Kevin, how can that be? How, how do you know that? Well, just look at the, region, the Nashua Regional Planning Commission's application to get one of the grants from the federal government. They state in there that one of the impediments to implementing the Sustainable Community Initiative is New Hampshire's long-stranding tradition of private property rights. That should put up a red flag for anyone. And so how do you tackle that as governor? I'll tell you how you tackle it. I know because, again, I worked very closely with Governor Benson. When you're getting the contracts for governor and council every two weeks and you're going through them, guess who's applying for a lot of these grants? These regional planning commissions through the federal government. And guess who, guess who gets to decide whether or not they get that funding? It's the governor and council. And guess what? We used to pull a lot of those grants. And as governor, unlike Governor Lynch, I will not be a rubber stamp for everything the executive branch sends me just to sign off on. I will scrutinize every single contract that comes through the governor and council, including grants from the regional, from the regional uh, planning commissions, and make them accountable to tell me what exactly they're doing with that money or else their funding gets cut off. All right, gentlemen, last question before the lightning round, and that's where we strike one of you with a bolt of lightning. Uh, explain your position on Second Amendment rights and constitutional carry, Kevin. Sure. 
Well, look, I've always, I've been a longtime advocate of Second Amendment rights here in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm the only candidate on this stage that has a stellar prior record, both as my time as a state legislator uh, in voting for Second Amendment rights, uh, and also having worked for Governor Benson and been involved in passing a lot of good Second Amendment laws while uh, while he was in office. Uh, with regard to constitutional carry, I've said I do have reservations about it. What I would like to see before we change the law is I'd like to look at a study of how, if we did change the law, implement it going forward, what would that mean in terms of public safety? Would it increase public safety? Would it decrease public safety? I want to know how the current law is being implemented right now uh, on, the, on the local level. Are there abuses going on? And I'd like to see all of these things so that I can make the best informed decision moving forward. The right to carry and bear arms is fundamental in the United States and here in New Hampshire. In fact, our own constitution our own Constitution is stronger than the Second Amendment itself in the United States Constitution. And uh, this is another area where I have experience. I'm the only candidate for governor who actually owns a firearm, at least on the Republican side. I'm the only candidate for governor who actually has a carry license issued by my local police department in Manchester. I'm a hunter. I'm a fisherman. I just don't talk about this. I actually live it. I don't need a study. If the legislature passes constitutional carry with the pr proper conditions, I will sign that bill and stand with gun owners of this state. It's the same thing with the stand your ground so-called legislation that was passed, Senate Bill 88. We shifted the presumption away from thinking that citizens weren't capable of exercising their fundamental rights without government intrusion. And we said the presumption is that the citizens do know what they're doing. And whether they're at home or in a public place, they have the right to exercise, and we believe that they will exercise that right responsibly. Constitutional carry is about the same thing. It is fundamentally important that we continue to preserve that Second Amendment right and that right to carry and bear arms. Thank you. All right, well, this brings us up to our lightning round portion of the debate, which is always fun. And uh, I guess we can go back and forth, or yeah. anyone, we'll do go back and forth. All right. Ten second, keep it to it, see what we can do. Can we stay seated for this round? Yeah. <laughs> you can yeah. stay seated. We'll agree on that. <laughs> Bopping up and down, that'd be good. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll kick it off here, and uh, we'll start with Kevin, and we'll just go back and forth that way. Uh, income tax pledge. I've taken the pledge against any broad-based sales or income tax. I've got an anti-broad-based sales and income tax gene in my body and the granite to back it up. I'm voting no sales. Absolutely. Again, another gene in my body against sales tax. <laughs> it's in my DNA through and through. No <laughs> sales or income tax. Uh, no increase in taxes and fees pledge. Absolutely. No increases in taxes and fees. Yes. I've already taken that. <laughs> parental rights. Absolutely. For parental rights. Um, for, uh, for parental rights and advocated for an amendment to our Constitution outlining the parents' rights over the, the welfare, health, and education of their children in the state of New Hampshire and is an education amendment, excuse me, a constitutional amendment that I would support as governor. All right. <laughs> Supports gambling in state casinos. Yes. Only at Rockingham. Only Rockingham, okay. Right to work. Yes. Categorically, yes. Yes, yes. I don't just talk about it. I voted for right to work when I was in the House back in the 1990s, and I've advocated for it strongly over the last four years. Okay. Repeal of Reggie. Yes, we need to get out of Reggie immediately. It's driving up electric rates in the state of New Hampshire. It's a bad program, yes. Yes, and see my energy plan at ovid2012.com. <laughs> O-V-I-D-E, don't forget the E. It depends. If they want to bury the lines, if they want to make sure that we have a right of first refusal, a power purchase agreement that gives us that, then we'll look at it. 
Yeah, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way. The wrong way is trampling on the rights of the private property owners in this state. I do think they should look for an alternative way, such as bearing the lines or having an energy corridor in the state, but not trampling on the, the rights of the private property owners for that project. And last topic here, support of homeschooling. I'm a big supporter of homeschooling, and again, I was proud to stand shoulder to shoulder, literally, with the hundreds of homeschoolers that showed up in the state of New Hampshire over the last few years to fight against legislation on the state level to put more restrictions on homeschooling in the state. We have a great homeschooling community. We need to continue it. As chairman of the State Board of Education, I fought for homeschooling rights and defended them, and as a parent, Betty and I were homeschooling parents, and so we live that life as well. Okay. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> you see it. <laughs> exactly. By right. the way, if Ovid and I have time to go to the movie theater right now, one of us isn't doing the right thing in this campaign. <laughs> Maybe we'll go together. <laughs> we'll both see it. <laughs> How about a nice round of applause for Andrew and Paul? Before we get into the most important aspect of this, which is the community participation, I just want to make one more comment about the Granite State Future Program, which was touched upon uh, in the debate tonight. Uh, Kevin mentioned that one of the, the, the language of one of the contracts for that, that's a legally binding contract, by the way, which was signed by the National Regional Planning Commission on behalf of all nine in the state of New Hampshire. It, it has a section called the Strategy to Address Barriers and Incorporate Existing Plans. And as Kevin properly pointed out, it mentions that anticipated barriers are our strong tradition of individual property rights and result in resistance to planning and zoning. Further in that same section, it goes on to suggest that the solution is to bring a committee together whose members include the DOT, the DES, and the OEP, and that that committee will, quote, work together to identify potential statewide strategies for reducing and or eliminating the barriers Unquote. Remember, the barriers are our property rights, and that's what this program is all about. We signed up for that here in Windham. We fought against it, and we lost the battle three to two. But it's not over because our town has the right to get out of that program at any time. So if you feel strongly about your property rights, I urge you to call all five of your Board of Selectmen. I would like to thank Phil Lociato and Selectman Bruce Bratton for voting against that program. Okay, so now we're done with these mics up here. I think what we'll do, oh, do we have, do we have some handheld mics for our audience? Great. Um, Andy and um, Rich. Okay, so we're going to have two guys walking around. Uh, hold up your hands. It's up to them as to who they're going to pick. We're going to take, if we're, we started a little late. Is it okay? We, we intended 25 minutes for this. Would you, guys, would you guys go for 25 minutes? Why don't you ask the audience who may be wanting to see the Republican National Convention? <laughs> oh, I love you, Howard. Thank you. Go ahead, start them off. Hi, you both. Have, yep. Hello. You both have a background, I believe, as being educators to some degree, and you both are for less government. Um, I want to know what your opinions were a few years back when um, kindergarten was not required, and obviously it now is. And Wyndham was one of four remaining towns, I believe, in the country that did not require kindergarten. I'm all for less government but I was kind of embarrassed not to have a kindergarten program in this town, especially with the taxes we pay. Um, interested in knowing where you, where you fell on that. 
As uh, chairman of the State Board of Education, I've always been for local control, and I fought for local control. The decision about whether to have kindergarten is the decision for the communities and the school districts of our state. It is not something that should be compelled. It's really not something that should be compelled by the, by the, by the state. This is a decision that needs to be made by the people in the community. And that's a decision that I think is best made by the folks here who are voting. Uh, that's, that's what local control is about. Now, whether I would vote for kindergarten if I was in the local community is a different issue. But if you turn over that decision to the state, what other decisions are you going to turn over to the state? Or worse, to the federal government? So local control means decisions, for better or for worse, on a lot of occasions, that uh, you may not agree with. And then it's up to you to work with the local people to change their decision if you want kindergarten. But don't look to Concord to force something on the community here that it didn't apparently vote for. Now, I'd say there are two separate issues that, you know, that are going on here. One is whether or not the state should be mandating to the local communities, which I don't think they should be. And again, as Ovid mentioned, it's one thing to say that you're for public kindergarten. It's another thing to say, should the state be mandating that on the local communities? Uh, when I was a state representative, I voted for funding, building funding to help communities have local public kindergarten in their communities. One of them, those towns that didn't have it, was my town at the time of Londonderry, which I represented it. And as a, as a local local representative of the community, I was happy to serve on the original committee that brought kindergarten to that community, but again, if the vote had come up later, if I had been in the House of Representatives when the vote came up later on to mandate that those communities that didn't have it have it, it's something I wouldn't have supported because I don't believe we should be sending those mandates out of Concord to the local districts. Steve Campbell, Salem, New Hampshire. I'd like to hear a little bit more about your stand on gambling, and specifically I'd like you to answer the fact, how can the state have the lottery and deny private businesses the, the chance to you know, flourish by providing something that, at least in Salem, people want? Thank you. Well, again, let me reiterate my position on expanded gambling in the state because there is a difference between the both of ours, our positions. First is that I don't believe the state should be choosing monopolies. I believe there needs to be a fair bidding process if we're going to have expanded gambling in the state of New Hampshire. And I've also called for having two licenses as well. If you really want gambling at Rockingham Park, you need to pass something or support something that's going to be palatable for the legislature to pass. And the legislature has shown they're not for giving monopolies to anyone one community. And again, I think we need to have a transparent process, which is why I said I support a fair bidding process. Uh, my opponent's law firm that he's a member of, they represent Rockingham Park. So all the more I believe it needs to be a transparent, fair bidding process. My only stipulations is that, number one, we have a strong regulatory infrastructure in place before any casinos are built, and that, number two, the revenues derived don't go, go to the general fund, because that'll only that will, will do is increase state spending, but instead should go towards offsetting property taxes, business taxes, or completing the uh, I-93 widening, which so desperately needs to get done for this community and the community of Salem. But absolutely, I will work with the legislature to bring a plan that works so that we can, we can have expanded gambling, again, at two locations. And who knows, Rockingham may be one of those locations, but it needs to be a fair bidding process. And this is where I take issue with my opponent, because he has said he will not be an advocate for expanded gambling and doesn't want it here in the state of New Hampshire, but at the same time, time says he wants it at Rockingham. I think the voters need to have someone who's being very upfront with them where they stand on this particular issue. It's important to see somebody's record and where they've been. Uh, I personally take exception to the suggestion that because my firm represents a client and we represent hundreds of clients, that my position as a candidate and certainly my actions as a governor is going to be determined by that. If I'm elected governor, I leave my firm, I leave my business, I leave my ownership position, I no longer have any stake, and I won't be, there won't be any, any conflict of interest. This is a business decision. Expanding gaming to bring in slot machines is about economic development, and it requires leadership. I do not subscribe to the view that expanded gaming belongs anywhere in New Hampshire where a successful bidder may be found. We need leadership in the governor's office to work with the legislature to say, where should this be? If you were the president and CEO of New Hampshire, Inc., and you were looking to offer a new line of service, 
You'd make the best calculated decision as to where it should be, where the people would want it, with the proper controls. It should be at Rockingham. And if the legislature cannot come up with the political will to pass a bill that meets those criteria, I will veto a bill that expands gambling behind it, beyond that. We do not want to be in New Hampshire that opens its doors for whatever form of gaming uh, that's going on. Okay, we want to be targeted and strategic. And I ask you to look at a WMER interview of November 10th, 2012, 11, uh, 2020, November 20th, 2011, thank you. And uh, see what Kevin was saying back then. I think we've seen an election year conversion here. And uh, people ought to take stock of that. Thank you. I had to ask a question. Sorry. We've been fighting electric rates in Concord, the legislature, the last two years. Give me some insight on how we're going to deal with the fact that we only use half of the power we generate, but we're paying some of the highest electric rates, which are really strangling business in the state of New Hampshire. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Jack. This is such an important issue because we do pay the fifth highest electric rates in the state of New Hampshire today, and it's stifling business, particularly manufacturing business, from wanting to do business in our state. IKEA was thinking about moving a manufacturing plant to the city of Claremont, which would have been a huge boom, economic boom for the city of Claremont, ultimately decided not to because they looked at the cost of energy in our state and said, you guys are nowhere near even competitive. And there's a reason for this. We've put a lot of onerous regulations on the utility industry in our state that has artificially increased the rates in the state of New Hampshire. We mandate today that the utilities purchase a third of their energy from renewable sources, wind, solar, geothermal. So we, and these are very costly forms of energy. All of us as rate payers and business owners, we're subsidizing those particular plants. And what I've said is that we ought to allow utilities to purchase energy at the cheapest cost possible. Let them all compete on the same level playing field. It's time to stop subsidizing energy plants that can't survive on their own. So that's one thing that we do is bring down the onerous regulations, get us out of Reggie, and push back against, as I call them, the Employment Protection uh, Prevention Agency, the EPA, against their onerous regulations out of Washington. And let's lo also look at investing in perhaps some new pipeline to bring natural gas into the state because it is so cheap right now. But it's an issue. We need a long-term energy policy in the state. We haven't had one for some time. Jack, I'm not sure what significance you attach to the fact that we generate, at least in New Hampshire, more energy than we're currently consuming. I don't believe that's the, co the cost or the, the, the reason why our energy rates are as high as they are. We're part of a regional grid, as many of you may know, and so that we benefit by having this coordination in our, in our region of energy supply, depending on the source. Now we're moving to natural gas, which is really actually helping our generators uh, to generate electricity at a lower rate. But we've, what we've done and we've allowed to happen in New Hampshire is through a matter of public policy, we've l allowed the electri electricity marketplace to achieve some sort of social end. And the social end is to try to deal with global warming and other issues and therefore we end up subsidizing technologies or generation capacity that isn't, isn't efficient, it's more expensive. Uh, we need to take a look at our entire energy structure, infrastructure, the grid that we're in, and we need, a, we need a modern electricity policy, energy plan. We haven't updated it since 2002, 2003 timeframe. It's about time we bring in a modern approach and to look at those things that are driving costs up, and it's a multiple, multitude of factors. Reggie is one of them, but it's not the only one. And so that oversight and that overhaul has to happen, and I'll lead in that capacity as well. Yeah, I figured I'd ask a question. Tom Flaherty from Milford. Uh, it's, I'm glad we're talking about energy. Uh, Reggie's a big extension cord through New Hampshire going right to Boston, and a couple of our towns are getting some benefit from that. Is there any room in New Hampshire, and as Jack mentioned, we do produce a little bit more than we, uh, than we use. Is there any room for an entrepreneurial ship uh, position of New Hampshire to put nuclear in place and sell it to Massachusetts instead of letting the province of Quebec make all the money? Well, we do have the capacity to um, put in a second nuclear power plant. Uh, the question is, 
whether or not the market supports that. And the market, the free market should be determining whether or not and to what extent we would de deploy or uh, create and, and uh, construct a second nuclear power plant. Uh, that's how we should be proceeding going forward. So I'm not here to, uh, to tell you or make a decision one way or the other on that. Uh, but when we look at, at Northern Pass, that's, that's one, only one source of energy. But there are a number of sources, and we need to make sure we have a diversified energy production generation capacity in New Hampshire uh, and in the region to make sure that we can deal with whatever changes may happen. Uh, and that's, a, that's an important part of the energy planning we need to undertake. So I, I don't have any problem with nuclear power if, if the market will bear it. But I don't want to subsidize that either. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Tom, all options do have to be on the table, uh, but they have to be the right options as well. Uh, and we do need to look, look at what the market is going to look like 10 years from. That's why I talk about having a long-term energy policy. It's why I've been talking about planning long-term as a state. We need a long-term vision and a 10-year economic plan for how we're going to have prosperity in the future beginning tomorrow. And this is one of those areas where we need to do that. As I mentioned before, we should be at least having the conversation, not only about nuclear, but talking about should we invest in upgrading our pipeline. Our pipeline, gas pipeline is very old in the state right now, but natural gas is so cheap. And it would be a shame if we looked back seven to 10 years from now and said as a state, man, if we had only done the right things back when we should have done it, it would have been a whole lot cheaper to invest in those areas with gas still at low prices than it is 10 years down the road. You know, it's kind of like the widening of I-93. When this first got the, it was Governor Sununu who got the ball rolling on this. And at that time, the project was going to be $30 million back in the 1980s. Today, the price tag is near $800 million to complete because we kicked the can so far down the road on this. We have to be planning long term as a state and energy policy is one of those areas. Hi, not dressed for the occasion. I love you both. And uh, I had the opportunity to meet the next president of the United States of America, Mitt Romney, in Manchester recently. And Mitt Romney's plea to everyone in the audience is, if you like us, or if you like them, convince one, one person who voted the other way to turn and, ch and vote this way. We need to, everybody needs to leave. Every, everybody needs to leave here and spread the word of these two gentlemen so we don't lose this next ticket for the governor. Thank you. I think the question was, would you believe, right? And I agree with the premise and the conclusion. And we do need to work together after this primary is over, for sure. Good evening. Uh, what I've learned here tonight is both of you agree on an awful lot. And there's some minor differences. You, have, you made a lot of promises tonight, or at least you made some inroads in what you'd like to see happen in our state. You have two years. What do you, where's the low-hanging fruit that you're going to go to first to make an impact with the people here and people in the state that you were the right candidate to be governor of the state of New Hampshire? Well, I appreciate that question very much. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right. The next governor has to hit the ground running. They have to know what they're going to do, and that's why I said you have to know what your vision and your plan is when you go in there. One of the things that I've been calling for as a cornerstone of my plan is for an aggressive reduction in our business taxes because we have the fifth highest business taxes in, in, in the state right now in the entire country between our business profits tax and the business enterprise tax. And if you look at our tax plans, they're very different. I call for a reduction in the business profits tax to 5% by the year 2020. Ovid only wants to lower it to 8%, which I think will hardly move the needle in getting more businesses here. I also want to give a tax cut to everyone paying the business enterprise tax too. Lower that to a quarter percent by the year 2020. But the low-hanging fruit in order to do that 
is finding the efficiencies and cost savings in state government, and I know where to go to look for it. It's in a 2003 efficiency committee study that was done, it was a bipartisan commission that did this, that found in the first year alone you could save $74 million doing things like consolidating certain state agencies like banking, securities, and insurance. All of these cost savings, $74 million in the first year, $420 million over five years. You know where that efficiency committee study's been sitting for the last eight years? On a bookshelf in the governor's office as collecting dust. Talk about irony. Efficiency committee study, nothing gets implemented for eight years. I would take that book off the bookshelf, blow the dust off, and start implementing a lot of those cost savings in the state government level because we need to find more efficiencies. We can find more efficiencies in state government. I appreciate your question very much, sir. And uh, you've asked what is the low-hanging fruit as a governor of the state of New Hampshire, first of all, let's recognize that, that the governor is the head of the executive branch, and we do have three branches of government. The kinds of things that we've just heard are things that require legislative action largely. The low-hanging fruit for the governor is to put together a statewide economic development plan, because this is about jobs, the economy, and reforming state government to create the best environment, not a friendly environment, the best environment in which to do business. First thing I would do as governor, appoint a business advocate to my staff. Someone who's got business experience who will work with a, uh, a volunteer group of business advocates and business, uh, business advisory group, if you will, leaders around our state. The business advocate will be there for businesses like yours who may have issues with state government in terms of permitting and will troubleshoot for those businesses. And then we're going to work with that advisory group to look at the changes in the executive branch, again, to create that most favorable environment. And then we're going to do a statewide economic development plan. We don't have a statewide economic development plan. How is that? We should have a plan that brands New Hampshire, that looks at the regions of our state for economic opportunity and infrastructure improvements. And it's going to be about jobs. I have real world leadership experience in business, and I'll take that to the bank the day one to make life better in New Hampshire for businesses and families and individuals. Thank you. Bob Barry from Manchester. How do you feel about eminent domain for private gain, such as the Northern Pass? Hi, Bob. I think we've already addressed that, but I supported the legislation uh, that was passed uh, this last legislative cycle that really took away the ability of a private interest to take use eminent domain powers for purely a private um, objective or gain. The Kelo decision that we saw the, New Hampshire, the U.S. Supreme Court hand down, sadly, our own uh, Justice Souter was part of the majority and wrote that opinion, uh, actually allowed uh, government to take private property for a project that actually was never built. Uh, that is not the New Hampshire way, and that's not the way it should be here. And I'll fight to protect private property rights against encroachment by government where it's excessive and only for private gain. Thank you. And we've had a lot of discussion around this issue tonight, and I'll say it again, I don't support taking land through eminent domain for uh, private projects. Uh, it sets a terrible precedent, it would set a terrible precedent in the state legislature. I applaud the legislature for the legislation they passed uh, this last session protecting the private, uh, the, the owners of the private property rights of the owners uh, for the Northern Pass project. And uh, I applaud the citizens of New Hampshire for passing a constitutional amendment a number of years ago, uh, pushing back against the Kelo decision that came out of the Supreme Court. So absolutely no eminent domain for a private gain. Thank you. Um, both of you guys have talked about infrastructure. Uh, you've talked a little bit about roads. You've talked about an energy plan. I want to hit and talk about education. I think it needs to be viewed as an infrastructure. But I want you to address telecommunications, <laughs> that other part of picking up the phone and getting a dial tone or moving data throughout the state. Because if you want to bring business here, you need to have a telecommunications infrastructure that can support bandwidth and everything else, especially if people are going to work from home and things like that. Um, when um, Verizon sold off to uh, Fairpoint. That 
It was our death knell, as far as I'm concerned, as far as getting that kind of stuff implemented across the state. How can, what kind of ideas do you have around getting that under control? Yeah, th this is another area where the state of New Hampshire needs to have a long-term strategic plan, especially in areas that don't have high-speed internet or broadband right now. I would like to purchase Verizon Fios. I can't where I am in my town of Litchfield. We need more competition as well. There's not a lot enough competition out there right now. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of hearing... I'm tired of hearing if I get away from my cable with Comcast and I go to DirecTV that all Comcast is going to do and go, well, you don't have the bundle package anymore, so it's going to cost you $500 to have phone and internet. I mean, that's ridiculous. We need to have much more competition. Here's the other thing, too. You know, allow the municipalities to be able to invest in this area as well, which right now they can't uh, because of some of our state laws that we have. You know, every time I go out to Keene, and I'm always asked by the folks out in Cheshire County, how do we get more jobs out here? And I'm reminded why every time I go out there, Keene is not a hub of economic activity in the state of New Hampshire. Because I'm about equidistant between Keene and Portsmouth. And it takes me 45 minutes to get to Portsmouth. It takes me an hour and a half to get to Keene. And my cell phone drops four times on my way out there. You're never going to get commerce and jobs to those areas of the state, whether it's Cheshire County, Coas, Grafton, Carroll, wherever, if one, you don't have the infrastructure, road improvements to get to those places. And number two, you don't have the communications upgrades as well. Finally, data centers. We should be talking to data centers. In fact, there's one that's looking to move into New Hampshire right now as a backup to the Boston metropolitan area, and they're willing to lay down the fiber optic line to get in here, which would be a huge benefit to the state of New Hampshire, and is something I'll be looking at if I become governor. I would raise a very important uh, question, and uh, I'm reminded of a breakfast meeting I had in February in Colebrook. You know, we talk about uh, New Hampshire having low unemployment relative to other states at 5.4% now. But if you look at regions of our state like the North Country, Colebrook, you're up, at, you're up in double digits of unemployment. And I said to the business leaders of that breakfast, including Jim Timmitz, uh, recently retired president of First Colebrook Bank, I said, why is it that when I have a product and I have an issue with it and I call the 800 number, I end up in India and not in Colebrook? And he said to me, because we don't have high-speed internet here, no broadband access. I said, Jim, what would it cost to, do, to bring the platform here to accommodate what you've described, Howard? He said about $600,000. $600,000 for a distressed area of our state? What are we waiting for? And a statewide economic development plan would target those areas where we would bring business interests, local communities, and our providers together to make a commitment to make it happen. We should be governing to the need, not the averages. And as a governor, that's what I'll do. And the other opportunity we have, it's related to this. How about modernizing our information technology system for state government? We don't, we don't have a platform available to our agencies and departments that enable them to schedule meetings like you do in business using a Microsoft calendar, Outlook calendar. Uh, we need to be looking at our state government, and that can help drive the infrastructure that we need for data services as well. Hi, I'm Bob Nelson from Hudson, New Hampshire. I'd like to know uh, your position on abortion and your definition of marriage. I'm pro-life, and I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, I am pro-life. Uh, I was the pro-family legislator back in the 1990s because I was a strong advocate on behalf of life issues, and I also believe that the definition of marriage is between one man and one woman. Can we have one more question and then we'll do closings? Okay, Ken is giving us a signal. Howard, in case you didn't hear it, I am pro-life. Pro-life, I'm an adoptive dad. Don't talk to me about anything else. And I, did, did you hear that now? Okay, I love you, thank you. I'm Chris Simolik, I'm from Londonderry. I understand that on the issue of casinos, you seem to be a little different on the implementation, but could both of you talk to me about your justification for casinos in New Hampshire? Thank you. 
Right now, we actually have expanded gaming going on in the state of New Hampshire, and it's being done under the auspices of our charitable gaming uh, laws in the state. And in fact, you travel all around the state, you'll see, if you went to Rockingham today and walked in, you'd probably ask the question, we don't have expanded gaming in the state of New Hampshire. I mean, they have an entire floor of uh, poker, blackjack, roulette. So it's happening in the state. It's over in Seabrook, it's in Manchester, it's in Nashua, it's in areas of the North Country as well. So the reality is we do have it here already, but it's highly unregulated. And what I've said is that if we're going to have it here, it needs to be a regulated plan and something that works for the state. Uh, and, and just one other thing of note too, because I, I know Ovid had mentioned this is an election year conversion, it's not. When I've opposed it in the past, the two reasons I opposed it is number one, I said I don't want to see proliferation. And what we had under all the plans that were being brought previously is things like you know six casinos, tens of thousands of slot machines, is that, and that's not what I want to see for the state of New Hampshire. The other thing too is all those previous plans had all of the revenues going into the general fund, increasing uh, you know state programs and state spending, and that's why I've put parameters around what I, what exactly that I would support, which is consistent with what I've said in the past. The issue, I think the question is, why would we support expanding gaming to include uh, slot machines? And that's what this is, that's what the question is. Uh, there is a lot of charity gaming around the state, and mo probably most no notably at Rockingham Park. Rockingham Park is a hundred year old facility. It's been the site of gaming for that many years, of most of it horse racing. And over the course of time, the economy, the economics of gaming has changed. Um, I don't support having expanding gaming throughout our state. It's an economic development issue for Rockingham as far as I'm concerned, which is why I'm open to it there. And why I would say to our leaders who believe that that's an appropriate place to have expanded gaming, to bring a bill forward that makes it possible to do it there with proper controls, taking the revenues, offsetting existing expenses, whether it's funding the I-93 expansion, targeting aid to public education, or lowering business taxes. But if we go beyond one site, we are opening up our state to proliferation. And that's why I, what I don't support. We need a focused leadership effort here in dealing with this issue. And, uh, and then the people in Salem uh, should weigh in to make sure that they want this. Thank you. Okay. Ken, can I just have one opportunity? Because th this is a very important issue. And I think it's very important that the candidates are making themselves straight with the people they're going to be voting for. You know, there, it was only a few months ago that we were both on a boat together, the Mount Washington, and we were asked this question about what we would support. And you can YouTube the video. And what Ovid said is that he supported that one site at Rockingham Park, but then if it worked there, he would be open to more sites in the state in the future. So I think it's very important that you understand the consistency of how we're answering this question and know that, you know, to figure out where exactly our positions are on it. And I would encourage everyone in the audience to do your due diligence on both of us on a lot of the issues uh, before you make your vote on September the 11th. And I'm, I'm actually grateful for that, this opportunity, if I may. Uh, I think that the bill that we should be passing is one that creates, has a condition precedent in it. It should not have one bill that has two or more opportunities for expanded gaming. But if after implementing it, if we do go this direction, and we have the controls in place, and we've tested it, and it seems to work, and the social ills that people are fearful of aren't there, or they're controlled and dealt with, then we can make a decision as to whether or not we'd expand somewhere else. That's the way you would do it in business. You wouldn't expand uh, a line and, and overextend yourself. You'd, you'd test it, make sure the market supports it, then you'd see what the market is further. But I think the one bill should be limited to that one site, and then we can take it, make a decision later on down the road. But it should not leave open in that one bill that we're definitely going to be going two, three, four uh, casinos. And that's, that's an important distinction. And this is an issue for this area. There's no question about it. Thank you. Okay, so now we're at the part of the evening where I'd like to ask both candidates to wrap up your comments. Maybe there's things that you didn't have an opportunity to say. Uh, this is the part where they'll get two and a half minutes and 
I'm, I'm happy to not stick to that. If you guys want to go a couple more minutes, it's up to you. Uh, but one thing I do want to say is when they're done, I know that uh, if you want to have an opportunity to hang out and, and come up and meet them personally, uh, Overt expressed that to me earlier, and I'm sure Kevin feels the same way. So if you're not on a, you know, in, a, in a rush to leave, you know, take the opportunity to come up, meet them personally, face to face, shake their hand, look in their eyes, and you know, continue the dialogue. I'm, I'm sure they'll appreciate that. And I'd like to take this moment and say thank you very much for coming. It was great having you, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone from Wyndham High School and uh, the town of Wyndham as well. So thank you. Well, Ken, I want to thank you and the Southern New Hampshire 912 Project and Paul Westcott and Andrew Hemingway, who I'm sure are now nestled into the couch somewhere and watching the Republican uh, convention. I want to thank you for coming this evening, too, and participating in this uh, civic activity, which we call a forum, where you can learn about the candidates. I'm Ovid Lamontang. I'm a fourth-generation New Hampshire native. I know the state, and I love the state. And I believe we need leadership for a change in the governor's office. We need principled, tested, conservative leadership based on experience, based on vision, and based on a plan to bring us into a new era of prosperity. There is no time to waste here. You know what's happening in Washington and nationally. I refuse to allow New Hampshire to be part of the national decline that's portended by the direction of Washington right now. We need to set our own course. We need to chart our own destination, and one that's committed to free markets and free enterprise, one that's committed to making sure that we have the best state to do business that we have the best state to raise a family, and the best state to live free or die, which is our motto. This primary process is about nominating someone who will present themselves and compete with a Democratic nominee. And the issues that we discuss tonight, I submit to you, aren't going to be the issues you're going to hear about in the general election. You're going to hear about tax policy, you're going to hear about education. You're going to hear about health care. You're going to hear about business strategies. On those issues, I have real-world leadership experience, and I can speak and debate our Democratic nominee, whoever that woman is, and it will be either Maggie Hassan or Jackie Silly, and show the contrast in direction. I can speak to it from not only experience, but also with a vision and a plan to move New Hampshire forward. There is no margin for error in this election cycle. We've had a failure of leadership in Washington, and frankly, we've had a failure in leadership in Concord. And what we've seen happen is a change in New Hampshire, thankfully, over the last two years. And that change can be consummated by making sure that we have a Republican legislature working with a Republican governor with a focus on making our state the best state to do business. I ask you to join our team. We're less than two weeks away from the primary. Our team is available to you at over2012.com, or you can call 668-2012. And I ask you to commit, regardless of who you support or vote for, that on September 12th we'll be united and we'll make sure that we have a Republican governor and a Republican president. So help us God. God bless you. God bless America. God bless the great state of New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Well, again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and participating in this forum with us. And Ovid, thank you very much as well. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm running for governor because I believe we're in desperate need of a change in leadership in the corner office, which is why I've been traveling all around our great state for the last 10 months, talking to people in every county throughout New Hampshire about my long-term vision for our state and our specific economic plan for how we're going to make New Hampshire into the most economically competitive state in the country over the next 10 years. And it's a plan that makes our, our business environment much more conducive by lowering our business profits tax and our business enterprise tax. It's a plan that brings down the cost of health insurance premiums by allowing insurance companies outside of the state of New Hampshire to compete in our market, bringing more competition into the marketplace. It's a plan you heard tonight that lowers our electric costs by taking rid of, getting rid of a lot of the onerous regulations on the electric, uh, the, the electric industry in the state of New Hampshire. And it's a plan that retains more of our young people here as well 
all because New Hampshire is now the third oldest state in the country. So we need to team up the private sector, our business communities, with our post-secondary schools and our high schools to making sure we're training students with the skills that they need for the 21st century jobs. And it's a plan as well that makes state government more transparent, more accountable to the taxpayers by putting metrics and outcomes in every program we're funding in state government because the taxpayers have a right to know what their return on investment is. But it's not just having the best plan and the biggest ideas that's going to be incumbent for the next governor. It's also showing that you have demonstrated you have the leadership experience and actually getting good reforms on the state government side. You know, some candidates are going to talk about bringing in more efficient budgets. I've written a reduced budget when I was the assistant director of our juvenile justice department. Some candidates are going to talk about supporting policy reforms like right to work, but I voted for right to work in the 1990s and advocated strongly on its behalf in the last few years. Some candidates are going to talk about nominations they'll make to executive branch boards and commissions. It's something I was intimately involved with when I was a senior aide for a governor. You know, we have a great opportunity in this state to make New Hampshire into an economic powerhouse and to also lead globally as well by outputting the best and brightest students through a robust and innovative education system. The question is, are we going to bite at that opportunity? We can't afford more of the same. We can't afford business as usual. We can't afford to keep moving the ball down the field incrementally. It's time to start throwing some long bombs. And that's why I've put forward a very bold new vision for our state. And I'm offering fresh new leadership that's undergirded by a conservative philosophy that it is not state government that creates jobs, but it's state government that creates the environment and atmosphere for good jobs to be created in the private sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm running to be your next governor because I have the energy, the specific plan, and the experience both in the public sector and in the private sector to lead us down that path to prosperity. I ask you to join my team, go to kevinsmithforgovernor.com, learn more about my plan. But more importantly than that, I ask for your vote on September the 11th. Thank you all very much, and God bless you. Before everybody leaves, I just want to I just want to do a show of hands. Who, who owns the United States Constitution? Wow, that's pretty impressive. I, I just want to point out one person who I met 15 months ago when we had our first meeting. His name is John Greco. He's sitting in the back. This man came into our meeting and he said that he would like to give out constitutions for free to anyone who came to our meetings. Since then, I've learned he's gone to almost well, many, many schools and many, many towns across the state offering to give them free constitutions. And as of now, he's given over 6,000 constitutions to our school system. So if you don't own a constitution or you know someone who doesn't have one, he's got a table back there. Feel free to pick up as many as you want. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>